Welcome to Circuit Secrets. In today's video, I'm going to show you how to install an Arduino VFO in a Cobra 21. This is intended for educational purposes only. It is illegal to transmit on certain frequencies in different places. Check your local and national laws before attempting or using these modifications. Now let's get started installing the VFO I designed in this video into a Cobra 21. You can find the source code for the VFO on my website, circuitsecrets.com. A VFO is a variable frequency oscillator. This VFO uses the SI5351 for direct digital synthesis. So this is a DDS VFO. The radio I'm installing it in is the same as the Cobra 25 LTD Classic and uses the TCP9106BP PLL chip. Different years of production use different chips, so confirm your radio has the same PLL before attempting this modification. The first step is to add a couple of components to the VFO. First, I needed to add a 5 volt regulator because the radio operates on 13.8 volts. The VFO requires 3 to 5 volts and any more would cause damage. I added the 5 volt regulator as shown in this diagram. I then added an optocoupler to protect the Arduino from any voltage present on the transmit switch of the radio. I wired the optocoupler to pin 13 as shown in this diagram. I performed this mod on this radio because the LED display had failed and it was a large enough radio to fit the VFO inside the case. This is a photo of the chassis of the Cobra 21 LTD Classic. You can see places where extra components could be installed but are missing here and here. I did not remove those components but they were only populated at the factory for the Cobra 25 LTD Classic and not the 21. This is because the Cobra 25 has more features such as RF gain. This is a schematic for the Cobra 25 LTD Classic. I use this schematic because there is no schematic available for the 21 LTD Classic. Here you can see the PLL chip. This is the data sheet for the PLL chip. This shows the pinout of the chip. To understand the pinout you need to know a little bit about PLL chips. They take a binary or binary coded decimal value from the channel selector which is just a large group of interconnected switches. The channel selector is connected to these pins. As the channel selector changes value, the PLL receives different binary codes called encodes or numeric codes. The higher the value, the higher the frequency unless it is inverted such as is the case with some PLL chips. A PLL chip takes these encodes and outputs a signal to control a variable oscillator called a voltage controlled oscillator or VCO. The PLL also takes a signal from the reference oscillator. In a typical AMCB radio, the reference oscillator runs at 10.240 MHz. The PLL uses this as a reference to measure feedback from the VCO to perform calculations to ensure it is on the correct frequency. The reference oscillator is also mixed with the VCO signal by the radio in the transmit and receive mixing circuits. This is the reference oscillator in the schematic. This is the VCO in the schematic. This is the transmit mixer chip, which performs direct mixing for the transmit carrier. This section is the receive circuit, which mixes down to the 455 kHz intermediate frequency indirectly in stages. These stages are sets of FETs and IF transformers calibrated with capacitors and adjusted to only pass part of the signal or an intermediate frequency. A frequency from the VCO that is 455 kHz lower than the output of the VCO used for transmit is needed for receive. This is why there are two offsets in the variables section of the VFO source code. The PLL chip reads the output of the VCO both to adjust the output of the VCO and to provide a transmit lock feature. The transmit lock is designed to prevent transmitting if the VCO is not functioning properly to prevent transmitting on unknown or off-limits frequencies. On this chip, the transmit lock is labeled as LD or lock detect. In the data sheet, I find the LD is set low when the PLL is out of lock. Low logic state is considered ground. High state is whatever the PLL runs on. I believe in this case, the PLL runs on 7 volts. With this information, on the schematic, I can show you the plan to install the VFO. This is the VCO, so I will remove the transformer that is the last stage of its circuit before mixing. I will sever the PLL's connection to the VCO so it does not wildly change its voltage trying to lock, which could generate unwanted noise. I will sever the connection between the LD pin and the rest of the circuit. 
I will run a jumper from the PLL's supply voltage to the circuit normally controlled by the lock detector pin. First I will remove the channel selector and display. Next, I cut away the mounting surface for the channel selector. Then I marked, drilled, and cut a piece of metal to act as the display retainer for the OLED and the mounting point for the encoder. I cut a piece of an old mouse pad as a flexible backing pad to hold the OLED in place. Next, the board had to be modified to make it ready for the VFO. Many parts could have been removed, but I tried to keep the installation as simple as possible with the fewest modifications possible. I will start from the PLL chip where most of the modifications are made. This is the pinout from the data sheet of the TC. 9106 BP. First I had to locate the output to the VCO and cut the trace. This is just a precaution to ensure the VCO does not seek and generate excess noise on the power buses. The oscillator out pin is labeled as XO. Next I have to bypass the transmit lockout pin of the PLL and set the output to high. The transmit lockout pin is labeled LD for lock detector. I bypass it by removing the jumper and installing a wire from the voltage supply of the PLL to the circuit that was connected to the jumper. The final modification is to remove the final stage transformer of the VCO. This disables the output of the VCO and gives a perfect connection point for the output of the VFO. Now I prep the VFO for install by wrapping it in some shrink tubing I cut to size and then glue it to form an envelope. I heat the shrink tube on the VFO. Now I add a capacitor to the output coax of the VFO. I needed to use a capacitor because there is DC present on the bus that carries the VCO signal. Once this is done, there are only four connections to attach the VFO. Power positive, the ground, transmit sense, and the VFO output. I make these connections as shown. Next I mount the display and encoder. The final results are this. The frequency counter shows it is on frequency. Finally, a radio check to confirm it's working. Hello. Hello. Alright, that's all I need. Thank you. Yep, sounds good up here. Really good. 10-4, I'll see you on 14. Alright, I'm done. If you enjoyed this content, please like and subscribe. And don't forget to turn on notifications so you see the next video. I am not an expert on CB radios, but I believe this information is accurate. If I made any mistakes, let me know. Thanks for watching.